We are in Mark 16, the real Jesus, Mark 16. And if you don't know how many chapters are in the book of Mark, somebody shout it out. How many? What's our last chapter? 16. We're almost done, people. We're almost done. Next week, we're finishing the gospel of Mark. And we've been calling this the real Jesus, and I want to remind you why. As we read through this letter, we see that Mark, the writer of this letter, is desperate to help people see the big picture of who Jesus is. He is the first person that wrote a gospel letter. And when I say gospel letter, I mean he, he, took, he took the life of Jesus and he put it onto paper. And so we read Matthew and Luke and John and all of them reference Mark's letter. Mark was the first. And Mark was really insistent that you and I see who Jesus really is, that he is the one who came to earth, became one of us, died for all of us so that any of us could be born again. And Mark writes this letter in a very succinct way, and by that I mean things move quickly, where Matthew would stop in certain subjects, or Luke would stop in certain subjects. Mark just keeps moving, keeps moving. In fact, the word that he loved to use over and over was the word immediately. You kind of get this feeling of like there's a rush that's happening, and there wasn't. Mark just wanted to keep things moving and give us the big picture of who Jesus is. Now, there's, there's only a few subjects that are covered across all of the gospel writers. And the one we're going to look at today is one of those, and that is the subject of the resurrection. All four writers speak about the resurrection. In fact, the Apostle Paul, years later, about 30 years later, he would tell us that our entire faith hinges upon the resurrection. He would say it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. You can look at the screen. He said this, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Oops, sorry. Yeah, there it is, yeah. And you are still in your sins. Let me read it again. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And what Paul is saying to us is this. He's saying that it is the death and the resurrection of Jesus that brought you and I into the opportunity of a saving faith. It's not just death. It's also resurrection. And the Bible tells us that Jesus became, as I said earlier, one of us, and he died on a cross, and we looked at that not that long ago. But that's not the full gospel story. The gospel story doesn't end with Jesus dying on a cross. It really never ends. The Bible tells us that Jesus rose from the dead, and really, that's the beginning of the gospel story, not even close to the end. You know, up to this point, there had been so many people who had come claiming to be the Messiah. Hundreds and hundreds of people throughout Israel's history had come on the scene, gathered a following, sometimes huge, sometimes very small, but they spoke of themselves as the Messiah. There's one thing that's consistent of every single one of these people that claim to be Messiah before Jesus. They're all dead. And many of them made claims of, when I die, I will rise again. We don't know their names because it didn't happen. False messiahs were everywhere. Jesus said, when I die, I will forgive all of your sins. And that's an incredible claim. Many messiahs made the claim. But when they died, they stayed dead. Jesus not only said, when I die, I will forgive all of your sins. But he validated that claim by resurrection. In fact, let me read to you. If you're, if you're quick on the draw, you can turn there, Matthew chapter 9. If it takes a little time, don't worry about it. We'll put it up here on the screens. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. This is a fantastic story. Jesus climbed into a boat and went across the lake to his own town. And some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you have such evil in your heart? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? And so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and he said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. 
The man jumped up and went home. Fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen. And they praised God for giving such authority. Do you see what happened there besides this incredible miracle? Jesus acknowledged why the resurrection is so important. Let me ask you the question, which is easier to say? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? It's easier to say, your sins are forgiven. I could say that all day long. And there's no way for you to validate that. I can say your sins are forgiven, but who knows if it really happens or not. And because Jesus wanted to validate the words, your sins are forgiven, he looked at this man who was lame, which meant he was unable to walk, and he said, I want you to get up. I want you to take your mat. We don't make a mess. Pick up after yourself and go walk away. You're healed and you're free forever. And when Jesus validated his words with that miracle, everyone was amazed at that moment. Why? Because the words of Jesus were backed up by his actions. And so when we talk about the importance of the resurrection, it's why Paul said, if there is no resurrection, then your faith is futile. Why? Because if Jesus said, when I die... I will draw all people to myself. If you believe in me, I will give you eternal life. These are beautiful words, but they're just words, if not backed up by action. And the action was that Jesus rose from the dead, not by his words alone, but by his actions. And resurrection is the validation of every word, everything Jesus ever said, every sermon he ever spoke. Every word that Jesus spoke is validated because he is alive right now, today. Amen? Every time you read the Bible, it's validated by the fact that God is not in a grave somewhere, but he's alive. I don't think I've ever heard the actual voice of God, like out loud. Some of you might have heard that. That's, and that's, I'm not, I'm not uh, mitigating that as being possible. I'm just saying for me. But, I, but I've heard God speak to me many, many times. And he's bypassed my ears and gone right to my heart. Now, some of you might say, that sounds kind of strange. But if you're married, you know that it's possible. Right? Your spouse can sometimes bypass the ears. They give you a look and you, that's all you needed. The look speaks to your heart. Right? God has the ability to bypass just my, my normal hearing and he has spoken to me so many times. My prayer, listen, my prayer is that God's spoken to every single one of you. Maybe not by ear, but by the heart, by the mind. God is alive. I've never died, not yet, or come back from the dead. But I, I, I understand why people have a hard time with the concept of a resurrection. You know, and I'll talk to somebody who doesn't know the Lord and they'll say, oh, resurrection, that's ridiculous. My, my, my argument isn't to them, what do you mean ridiculous? Are you, you're crazy. No, no, the truth is, is that it's really hard to believe in a resurrection. It is. In fact, I want you to see that the Jews had a hard time believing in a resurrection. It wasn't even something that existed in their psyche. It wasn't something that was even a part of their religion. You know, we think of resurrection as being just kind of an obvious, but the reality is, is that Jesus' closest friends his family, and the very religion that he was at that point a part of did not believe really in a resurrection. Do you remember the story of Lazarus dying and his sisters, Mary and Martha? And they went and they got Jesus and Jesus came to them and Martha was really discouraged. And she said, Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Nevertheless, whatever you ask of God, he will give it to you. And boy, that's some faith. I'd love to have faith like that. Except that it really wasn't faith. It was like God talk. It was spiritual talk without any teeth. Jesus said, right after she said that, Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Wow. Wow. And guess what she said next? John chapter 11, she said this, I know that he'll rise again in the last days. In other words, what she did is she threw a Bible verse at the, the living word of God. <laughs> she threw a Bible verse at Jesus. Maybe not the best idea. 
Jesus, let me tell you the Bible in case you weren't clear. I know that he'll rise again in the last day. What, what that means is this. I know that nationally, culturally, as a part of our Jewish faith, there's going to come a time in the last days when we will all rise again. That's what a Jew believed. The very idea of a personal resurrection, an individual resurrection, was not a part of their, their concepts. Nobody was looking for Jesus to rise from the dead. And so, friends, when we talk to people who have a hard time believing in the resurrection, I think it's a great thing to do is to say, guess what? You're not alone in that feeling. Jesus' friends didn't believe he was going to rise from the dead. Don't feel bad for having a hard time with that. Jesus' friends came to the tomb not because they bought popcorn and were expecting a great show. They didn't go to the tomb waiting for Jesus to come out. They went to the tomb for one reason. The women went there so that they could put spices on his body simply so that his body, as it was decaying, wouldn't let out a bad odor. Imagine that. It wasn't the great faith of these women at the tomb. It was, a, it was the, just the fact that they were so devoted to Jesus. They loved him so much, they didn't want his body to smell the way other bodies would smell. Nobody expected a resurrection. Not even Jesus' closest friends. They knew something was special about him, but nobody was ready. So, Mark chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Verse 2. And early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? So they're coming there at very first opportunity. Our days begin, you know, we, we're on a calendar that is, it starts at midnight, right? A new day begins at midnight. But for the Jew, a new day begins at sundown. So say six, seven, depends on what time of the day it is or what time of the year it is. That's when the new day begins. And so they had just come off of a huge holiday and a Sabbath day, double, like a double whammy, back-to-back -back holidays. And the Sabbath was a day that was meant to be you were at home, you didn't go anywhere, no work was allowed. It had become a day that was incredibly restrictive. It had lost its beauty in a sense it was really focused on just kind of holding people back at this point. A day of rest had become a day of control in many ways. And they waited until the Sabbath was over. So Sabbath had ended at about, say, 7 p.m. the night before, but it's pitch black now. There was nothing they could do. And so they waited until the first light was coming. And as soon as they thought, man, it's, I mean, that sun's about to come up. Let's get to the tomb as early as we possibly can. And that's what they did. We also know in one of the other Gospels, we're told that Mary Magdalene got to the tomb before the other ladies. And that she got there while it was still dark. So you imagine this group of gals had talked. You know, they'd worked it out. Group chat or something like that, you know. Let's meet at this point, at this time, and we'll all get to the tomb. Mary kind of cheated. She wasn't waiting. She just got there a little early. Mary gets there, and the tomb, the stone, has been rolled away. And before she even takes a moment to look inside, she, she takes off. She goes running to the disciples and says, somebody stole the body of Jesus. So the great faith of these people, mm -mm, nobody had any faith in a resurrection. First thought was, somebody stole the body of Jesus. But we read that the rest of the ladies were walking there, they're on their way, and they had only one issue in their mind. It wasn't, what are we going to say to Jesus now that he's risen from the dead? It was, who's going to move the stone so we can get in to Jesus? Who's going to help us move this incredibly, just, I mean, massive stone so that we can get to the body of Jesus? Verse 4 Mark 16, verse 4, when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. So I guess one problem was solved that day. 
In fact, we're told in John's gospel that not only had the stone been moved, and when, you, when you're in a, you know, the idea was this, you'd have a cave, and anybody buried in a cave or in a, in a um, yeah, in, in something of that nature, that was somebody who had some money. That was, a, that was a rich man's tomb. And we know that Jesus would be buried in that way, but we know he didn't have any money. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man, a council member, and he requested the body of Jesus, and he had Jesus' body placed inside his own family's tomb. And they would roll these stones about, yea, tall, massive. They would put them right in front of the entrance. These were not high entrances. It was very small. You would, you would crawl to get inside. And the stone was so massive, these women are thinking, how in the world are we going to move this thing? Hopefully somebody will be there to help us. And in John's gospel, we're told, told that not only was the stone moved, but that it was moved uphill. It, had, it wasn't just like cracked open for people to sneak inside. It had been completely moved up a hill. And by the way, John tells us that an angel moved this. It's like an angel came by, grabbed it, and just went, Phtoom, you know, chucked it. A little shot put. And in fact, we're told that it wouldn't be very long before there would be an angel sitting on that stone just waiting for more people to show up. <laughs> I'm waiting. I got news. I'm so excited. Somebody turn the corner and see me here. These women come and they, in verse 5, it tells us they entered the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Luke's gospel tells us that these were angels. Verse 6, don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. He was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. And trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. Verse 8, they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So in Mark's gospel, we're told the women came into the tomb and they see one guy dressed in white, an angel, Luke tells us. In fact, Luke tells us it was two angels. How do you miss two angels? Because when you came in, you saw one angel who was talking to you. But there were two in the tomb, and they gave him a very clear message. First of all, relax. You know, they walk into a tomb expecting to see a body, and they saw a body, but this was, an, this was a live body. Not who they assumed was going to be there. And you can imagine, they kind of freaked out. And this angel says to them, hey, you're looking for Jesus who is of Nazareth. I know who you're looking for. And the one who died is the one who has risen from the dead. He's not here anymore. And I want you to go and I want you to go tell the disciples. Make sure Peter hears it because he's really condemned right now. He made some huge mistakes. Make sure Peter's there to hear this. Tell them Jesus is alive and he's waiting for them in Galilee. Galilee was hometown. It was ground zero for all the ministry of Jesus into the life of the disciples. And this is where they got to know him. This is where they began to follow him. This, is, this was their safe place, you could say. And Jesus told, or these angels told them, tell them to go to Galilee and I'll meet them there. Let's just say this, or acknowledge this. They didn't go to Galilee right away, did they? They stayed in Jerusalem for a while. You kind of get this idea of there's Jesus up in Galilee, you know, sitting by the sea, like, okay, any day now, any time now, right? Jesus could have stood up there and said, man, these guys are so lame, I got to get new disciples. Even when I'm alive, they won't show up. I mean, what more do I have to do? You know, I rose from the dead. The least they could do is travel to Galilee. <laughs> But what does he do? He comes down to them. You see, even in his resurrection, you'd think that everyone would be so excited and so ready. Nobody's ready. Nobody believes it. An angel says, go to Galilee. And they're all so scared, nobody moves from Jerusalem. And so Jesus probably, you know, all right, I, I came back from the dead, but I can come back down to Jerusalem too. And Jesus is going to meet them, and we'll look at that next week. Jesus is going to meet them in Jerusalem, and he's going to change their lives forever. Because when you meet a resurrected Jesus, your life is changed forever. 
And that's why I titled this message, because we're going to look at a couple of the issues that happened. I titled this message, Resurrection, The Wildest Weekend Ever. I mean, this is a crazy weekend. It's a weekend of events that honestly, none of his people, none of Jesus' own people were a part of it. They had no concept of a resurrection. And if you're here today and you're thinking, it's hard for me to imagine resurrection. Yeah, I see it on paper. I see it on the screen. I understand it happened. I believe it, kind of. I understand. I don't think it's strange to have a hard time believing in a resurrection. Certainly, Jesus' people did not. Nobody expected him. And at some point, we read, so let me go back a little bit to things that we know happened, and we'll kind of coalesce the gospel accounts. Something that happened, but we don't read about it in the gospel of Mark because Mark is so fixed on just getting to the resurrection. But we also know that before the women got to the tomb, we know that during, sometime during the weekend when Jesus was buried in the tomb, there was a huge, a massive earthquake that happened as well. And things shook and, the, and you know, the whole ground was shaking. And the stone, we're told, was moved away. Now we also know this, that before that happened, there was a group of guards that had been placed in front of the tomb. Maybe you remember that, maybe you hadn't heard that. But remember, when Jesus died... And Joseph of Arimathea asked for the body. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, basically the religious leaders, they came to Pilate. And they said, we're concerned. And I'm sure Pilate was thinking, now what? I I already killed the one you wanted me to kill. What more do you people want? We're concerned that the disciples are going to steal the body of Jesus because Jesus said he was going to rise again. Please see this. The only group of people that took serious the claims of a resurrection were Jesus' enemies. They were the only ones that took his word serious. His friends didn't think it was even possible. But his enemies gathered together and they said, we need a group of guards in front of this tomb because we don't want anybody to steal this body and then throw up their hands and say, hey, Jesus rose from the dead. And so... Pilate said, you have a group of guards, put them in front of the tomb. Go for it. And you and I should be so thankful that that happened on that day. Because the very fact that this happened adds incredible credence to the claims of resurrection. These disciples ran when guards came to arrest Jesus. Do you remember that? Nobody stood by Jesus. Now he's dead and he's buried All their courage is gone. All their hope is gone. All their expectation of Jesus being the Messiah, it's gone. There is no way they were going to be moving through a group of guards armed in order to steal a body with nobody knowing about it. But this was the wildest weekend in history. And a group of guards were on duty and they were there protecting a dead body Don't think that they were just, you know, all sleeping or relaxing or, oh, this is not important duty. Rome had a great way of inspiring their soldiers. Not a great way, sarcasm. It was this. If you didn't do your job, you got that person's punishment. So death for death. So if you lost a dead body, you die. So the Roman soldiers were motivated to do a good job. But there was a great earthquake And something happened that put all of the the guard into, there's no better, I mean, they all fainted, basically. No better way to describe it. Group of hardened soldiers are passed out. And now what happened? Now, when they got to the tomb, were the ladies like tiptoeing over guards? No. Sometime before the sun came up, one guard pops up, another guard pops up. They all start looking around at each other like, what? just happened and they look right to the tomb and they see that the stones rolled away and they are all about job security there is some incredible fear right away and they go running not to Pilate because Pilate Pilate's Roman off with their heads would have been his statement 
No, they run to the, 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 Roman, or the, the Jewish council. They run to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees. They run to them and they say, we've got a massive problem. What is it? His body's gone. There was this huge earthquake. We all passed out. We, what we came to, and he's gone. And we don't know what to do. And so the, uh, the Jewish leadership had a plan, and the plan was this. Lie. Here's some money. Lie. What's the story? Get your story straight. And the story was this. The disciples came and stole the body of Jesus. And we're told in several Gospels that this is why that story has been passed on for now 2,000 years. Because some Roman guards got paid off to tell a story that never happened. And, by the way, after they got their money and they started telling the story, they ran. They took off. They must have gotten paid very well. But they bailed. And before, and, oh, excuse me, after all of this happens, this is when the women get to the tomb. They weren't tiptoeing around soldiers who were passed out. They got to the tomb, and it was completely empty. The whole land in front of it was empty. The tomb was empty, except for now these angels that were there. Jesus was not there he was alive. And it's as if Mark is challenging his readers to take it serious. In fact, when Mark wrote this, almost everyone, and by almost I say, I say almost only because I have no way of verifying it was everyone. So we'll say almost. Almost every single person that, John, that Mark writes about was still alive. And so several times, Mark writes this fact, Mary Magdalene, Salome, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, they were there. And he says it three times in the two chapters that we've been looking at in Mark 15 and Mark 16. Three times he points out their names very clearly. Why? I believe Mark is challenging everyone who would read his letter. Go ask them yourself. If you don't believe me, go talk to Mary Magdalene. She lives right down the road. Go ask her, email her, you know, whatever they did back then, you know. Go talk to her. She's right there. Don't take my word for it alone. Go ask them. Who should I ask? Mary Magdalene. Salome. Go ask these ladies. They were there. But that raises another interesting issue. The fact that Mark mentions these ladies several times, not only does it do us good to know that he's saying they're still here and you can talk to them. In fact, when the Apostle Paul would write about it in 1 Corinthians, he said Jesus appeared to over 500 disciples at one time, of whom most of them are still alive to this day. Can you imagine if you were a reporter in that day and your job was to talk about resurrection? And you had 500 people you could go talk to? Tell me your story. It's easy. I thought Jesus was dead and then he showed up. And we talked. And he told me to go make disciples of all nations. And that he is going to be with me until the end of the age. Really? Are you willing to... Are you willing to put your name on a document? Yes, I'm willing to put my name on a document. Put my name on a document. 1 Corinthians, no problem. Your name's in a document now. Are you willing to die for this? And most of them would. Most of these same people that said they believed in a resurrection would die simply because they believed and they couldn't lie about the fact that Jesus had risen from the dead. But there's something else I want you to see about Mark's account when Mark mentions women over and over and over. And it's important because, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lady's testimony was of really no consequence back in those days. Okay? In fact, there was a, 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 a Roman, but he was Greek, but he was a part of the Roman uh, empire. He was a philosopher and he was a very well-known writer and he, he wrote something down and he said, the reason I cannot believe in a resurrection is because the resurrection story was first accounted by women and then he said this, not me. He said this, ladies, not me. He said, we can never take a woman's account serious because all women are hysterical. <laughs> and I don't think he meant like they had a good sense of humor, okay? 
all women. I mean, you can't trust their opinions because, you know, these ladies are all crazy. That's, in essence, what he was saying. And all the men would read it and say, oh, yes, that makes perfect sense. And the very, fe- listen, if Mark and John and Luke and Peter and James and, and, and Matthew, if they were all trying to tell a story that wasn't true, let me tell you something. Leave the women out of it. Because it did nothing to add to their credibility. In fact, it hurt their credibility. So if you're trying to tell a story that people all over the world will listen to, then don't include the women. Don't say they're the very first people that saw Jesus risen from the dead. That minimizes, that that devalues your credibility. And I got to tell you, the fact that they didn't change anything speaks so much to how true every word of it is. Mark couldn't say something that wasn't true. Who was there? Mary Magdalene. Oh, come on, we got to have a better story than that. No, we can't. There is no better story than the truth because the truth will set you free. And it was these women that were there. It wasn't the men. It was these women. Does that make the story less credible? Well, in that day it did. But nevertheless, they kept to what was true. And Jesus appeared several times. In fact, for the next 40 days, we're told, Jesus would be appearing over and over and over. And then finally, he said to his disciples, his close group, he said, I want you to wait for me in Jerusalem until the promise comes. The promise of my Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And they waited 10 days in the upper room and nothing was happening. And they're talking. In fact, we know they decided to do something because they were waiting so long. They picked another apostle. We're supposed to have 12 and we're only 11, so we picked another apostle. And then 50 days from Jesus' death, 50 days later, Jesus, we're told that the, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove. Tongues of fire, we're told, came upon the disciples, the apostles in the upper room, and they began to speak in tongues and they began to praise God. They began to preach the gospel, and people gathered from all over Israel because it was a huge holiday. They had all come together, and everybody gathered together, and they said, What is this thing that's happening right now? And Peter stands up from the group and he says, Men and brethren, this is that thing that was prophesied by, the, by Joel. Many, 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 many years ago. Why am I telling you this? Because today is that day. Today is Pentecost. This day, 2,000 or so years ago, was the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples. And they began to speak in tongues. And they began to preach the gospel. And on that day, over 3,000 people were born again. Today, 2,000 years ago. I don't know about you, but I'm really ready for another Pentecost. We need one. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Things happening that can't be explained. I don't need things that can be explained. I need things in my life that can't be explained. I need miracles. I need resurrection power. I don't need, if I can explain it to you, somebody else smarter than me can unexplain it. What you need and what I need is that kind of evidence that comes only from God when he speaks directly to your heart, bypasses your ears, bypasses your eyes, and goes right to your heart and he says, I'm alive, I'm here, I'm with you, I can heal you, I can help you. That's what they had on that day, on this day, 2,000 years ago. Happy Pentecost. Jesus had risen from the dead, and he was in hiding. He's showing up all over, he's scaring people all over Israel. We'll look at some of that next week. There's one more thought I want you to have before we finish, though, today. And it's this. It has to do with the Sabbath. And again, if you're not familiar with what the Sabbath is, the Sabbath was a commandment that God had given. It was one of the Ten Commandments. Keep the Sabbath holy. That was that on Saturday, on what we call Saturday, was to be a day of rest. It was a day when you were to be with your family. You were to do no work. You weren't to go out to the fields. It was a day where you you stop your natural inclination to do more. 
I got to do more, right? If five days of work is good, six days is better. If six days of work is good, seven days is better. And life was about survival in those days. And if you could get one more day in, a little bit more grain, a little bit more food, people would take advantage of that. But God, from the very beginning, said, no. No. I want you to take a day, and I want you to do nothing but honor me. Respect me for this day. And it had become a day of frustration for many people. What can I do? What can't I do? What can't? It was kind of like this thing of like, how close to the line can I get without falling over? Is this allowed? Is this allowed? Is this allowed? Is this allowed? And so they had law after law after law after law after law defining what you can and what you cannot do. So much so that by the time that Jesus had come onto the scene, people were just exhausted. A day of rest had become a day of frustration. And there's something I want you to see. Look back at verse 1, if you would, with me. I think it's maybe the most important statement that was said in connection to the resurrection. And it's this. Are you ready? Mark 16, verse 1, when the Sabbath was over. Friends, from that moment forward, from that Sabbath, I'm, I'm literally talking to you about 2,000 years ago. From that Sabbath forward, Sabbath no longer was a legitimate practice. Sabbath no longer had power over people. This idea of a law that you must Keep this. You must do this. You have no freedom. We're going to control you. We're going to tell you how to live. We're going to tell you what to do. This was gone forever. On that morning, Jesus rose from the dead, and all law before was abolished. Oh, now I have to keep the Sabbath. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. Oh, I have to live this way because that's how you don't have to live that way. Oh, if I don't do this, then I'm not as good of a Christian as other Christians. Let nobody ever tell you that again. You are free because Jesus rose from the dead. When the Sabbath was over, my question for you before we finish today is this. Is it over for you? Is it over? Or are you still living with this sense of guilt or condemnation or expectation or other people putting upon you? And I can't blame other people because I don't know who they are. But I can say to you, today is a day you can stop letting other people's expectations dictate how you live. You have a choice because Jesus rose from the dead. You have freedom because Jesus rose from the dead. You no longer have to be held by the bondage of Sabbath or this or that. You're free. And I can't tell you what a joy it is to give a message of freedom. Seriously. And I know. <laughs> you know, Judaism was this kind of, <laughs> it was this religion that started so beautifully. It was so perfect. It was so perfect that it, everybody died from it because it was perfect. It was a perfect law, a perfect system. And Christianity can do the same thing to people. It can create a bondage over our lives. I have to live this way. I have to be this way. My parents expect this. My friends expect this. My church expects How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Friends, you're free today. And I hope you are good, by the way. But if you're not, you're still welcome and you're loved and you're free. And on that day, on the day that we're here today, right now, Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit on people, and he set them free. Listen, if you don't see how different Peter was from Mark's gospel to the, to the book of Acts, then you, you don't even see what happened. J Peter was running for his life in Mark, and in Acts, he's standing up to people, and he looked at them, and he says, you crucified Jesus, but he's alive today. The boldness and the power, and here's my question for you, and we're going to pray because it's so important that we do this today. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you have freedom today? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Are you free today? 
And if there's any part of you that's saying, I think so, then this is your day. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. Are you feeling beaten down, weak? Guess what? This is the day that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit again. And some of you are saying, well, I've already been filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's great. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty much on a daily need. I'm feeling the need every day. Sometimes it's like every half a day. It gets a, some days are hourly. <laughs> Last hour was good, but it's time for, I need more of God right now. Maybe there's things in your life that have been kind of, um, how do I say this in the best way? They're getting in the way of you having more room for God in your life. I want to ask you today to empty yourself and let Jesus fill you with himself. And so what I want to do is I want to pray for people. Before we do anything else, we're going to pray. If you would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray for you. We're going to ask God to come and pour out his spirit upon you. We can't, we can't go by, it's Pentecost today, people. Hello. If we don't pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, what are we doing, right? This is the day. And if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, maybe you have before or maybe you want to again. I don't care if it's all of us, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to get out of our chairs and we're going to come and stand up here in the front. We're just going to ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit once again. So if that's you, I want you to get up and I want you to come down. Come on down if you want to be prayed for. Just come. And, it, and so now it's almost all of us. So those that are sitting, you're like, oh man, they think I'm a terrible Christian. <laughs> we don't think you're a terrible Christian because you're free. Sit down, stand up, do whatever. You don't want to come, don't come. Don't feel no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but fill the aisles, fill this place. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can't just keep playing church or playing Christian or doing just day-to-day -day stuff. Amen? We need more. Who's here that says, my family needs more of God? My workplace needs more of God. You know, I work at a church and I'm still raising my hand, okay? <laughs> Whose school needs more of God? Hmm. We need more of God. We need more of God. So Father, with hands lifted up right now, we're just done. Lord, we're done with ourselves. We're done with other people's expectations. Maybe we just need to say today we're done with our own expectations that we put upon ourselves. We've lived under such guilt. We live with such a sense of burden and weight upon ourselves ourselves. And yet, Jesus, you said that I've come to set people free. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I pray right now, Lord, with hands lifted, that our burdens would be removed and that we would take on your burden, Lord, that your yoke that is easy. And Lord, I'm asking on this Pentecost, we weren't there then, but we're here right now. And Lord, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we believe that, Lord. And we believe that you bypass our eyes, you bypass our ears, and you speak to us. You speak to us from your word. You speak to us through life. You speak to us through friends. You speak to us through hardships. Lord, you're not silent. You're speaking. And I pray right now, God, I pray right now that you would fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Empty us of ourselves and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Make us a people, God, that are full of your Holy Spirit. Whether we've experienced that many times in our lives or this is the very first time in our lives, we need, we need you right now, God. Lord, empty. If there's anything else in us that we can just give to you right now, we want to give it to you so that there's even a little bit more room for more of you, Jesus. Please, God, we're drowning from our own frustrations. We're drowning from guilt. We're drowning from hopelessness. And we want to be overwhelmed, God, with hope and life and freedom. Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Baptize us in your Holy Spirit. Cover us, God, 
in all that you are so that there wouldn't be any more room, Lord, for us to mess things up, for us to live under guilt. We are free and whom the Spirit sets free is truly free. And Lord, I pray that from this, just as it did for the disciples 2,000 years ago, that from this, many people would be born again. That as we are overflowing with Jesus, that you, God, could touch many people. And that when the Sabbath is over for them, they can enter into new life. And as we end our Sabbath mentality and we enter into the resurrection mentality, we know that you will use us in many beautiful and wonderful ways. And I pray God now, I pray now, Lord, that that there would be a sweetness in our lives because of Jesus. We welcome you, Lord. We receive you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And we're going to worship some more. You can stay here. You can sit down. You're free. Do whatever you want. Let's worship the Lord some more. Thank you so much for watching us today here at Calvary San Diego. We're so glad you took the time to be with us in our service. We'd like to encourage you that if you would like to see more of our studies, you can do so at our website. And we also want to give you the opportunity there to give if it would be in your heart to do so. You can do that at our website, calvarysd.com giving. We'd love for you to partner with what God's doing here in San Diego. God bless you guys.